every single system out there is going to have its own jargon specific to that platform. Windows has registries, Ribbon UI, EXE, malware. macOS has Finder, Natural Scrolling, DMG. And Linux is absolutely no exception. And not understanding this jargon is going to make it fairly hard to go and read things like, you know, distro reviews or maybe watching videos on distros because a lot of people, me included, typically just throw out this jargon expecting everyone consuming that content to already know what it actually means. So let's talk about some of the common terms you're going to come across. And even in that couple of seconds, I already used a bit of jargon, that being distro. Distro is a term that you will hear basically as soon as you start looking into Linux. You might also see it as distribution or flavor. All of these terms mean the exact same thing. With Windows and Mac OS, you have a single operating system made by a single company. Maybe there's like contractors that come in, but it's always going to be released as this is Windows 10, this is Windows 11, this is Mac OS, however they're naming them at this point. But Linux isn't released like that whatsoever. Linux isn't just a single operating system. What it really is, is a bunch of small operating system projects that all use the exact same core. And by using this same core called the Linux kernel, I'll get into that in just a bit, they all become interoperable with each other. So if I write a program for one distribution, I can then go and run that program on another distribution, assuming it has all of the pre-installed software that I actually need. So the best way to think of a distribution, distro, flavor, whatever term you want to be using, is a distro is a set of pre-installed and pre-configured software alongside the Linux kernel kernel that make up this Linux operating system. But speaking of Linux distros, one thing you'll commonly hear is this is Debian based, this is Arch based, this is Ubuntu based. Or if we're not talking about Linux distributions, you might hear something like this is a Firefox fork, this is a Chromium fork. In this case, based and fork mean the exact same thing. So a good number of the projects in the Linux world are open source. The source code is available to the world and is given a license where anybody is allowed to go and use it, assuming they follow the terms of the license. So when something is Debian based or when something is a fork of another application, what that means is the program that you're using is derived from that original application or that original distribution. Now, when you install a Linux distro, it's commonly going to come pre-installed with something known as a DE or a WM. A DE is a desktop environment. These would be things like GNOME, MATE, KDE, XSCE, and a WM is a window manager. This would be things like DWM, i3, Awesome WM, and the list goes on forever. Now, these are two very similar concepts. What they are both going to do is give you a GUI so that when you boot Linux, you're not just going to be dropped directly into a terminal and have absolutely no idea what to do. But a desktop environment is more akin to something like Windows or Mac OS. When you install it or when it comes with your distro, it's going to come with everything you'd expect to be there on a computer. Things like your web browser, your video player, maybe a text editor, maybe a word processor, maybe an image editor, things like that. But a window manager is just going to do what the name says. It is going to manage your windows. It's going to work out where windows should be spawning on your screen and that's all. You might have things like web browsers and text editors also installed alongside the window manager, but the window manager is not what gave you those applications. And very shortly after you start using Linux, you may run into a situation where you want to install some new programs. Let's say you want a new video player, for example. This is going to be done through something known as a package manager. So when you want to install something on Windows, very often it's going to come with some sort of installer. That installer is gonna set up the application, maybe prompt you to install some toolbars, but more importantly, download everything the application needs to actually run. These extra things the application needs to run that aren't part of the application are known as dependencies. 
Now, when you use a package manager instead, what it's going to do is every time you install a new package, think of a package as just the installed software, it's going to go and automatically install the dependencies, update things, all of that fun stuff to get the application actually working. So the best way to think of a package manager is as a global installer. This is the one installer you have to install every single program rather than having individual installers for every single application. Programs can be installed outside of your package manager by going and compiling the code yourself, or if it's a script file, just running the script. But the package manager acts as a very convenient way to install most of the applications you're going to care about. Now, when you compile code or you download a pre-compiled application, which is what your package manager is typically going to do, this is going to be known as a binary. Basically, think of binaries as the Linux executable files like you'd have on Windows with the Windows EXE. On that note, you might hear the term native binary, or that is not a native application. This is far more common to hear in the Linux gaming space. What this basically means is a native binary is an application, a game, piece of software, whatever you want to call it, that was designed and compiled to run on Linux. Basically, it is native to the Linux environment. Imagine if it was like an animal native to a habitat. You may also hear this in reference to web applications where it's running inside of your web browser because this is something that was made to run on every single operating system, not made just to run on Linux. Now, software release models can get very complicated and even just downloading the correct version of an application can be kind of difficult because a lot of the time it's going to be filled with sort of of developer jargon. Some of those terms are things like stable, canary, nightly, and daily. These fit into the same sort of category as things like beta and alpha, which if you're a gamer, you've very likely heard before. So a stable application is the latest version of an application that is considered safe to use for production usage. It doesn't have any horrible breaking bugs. It's not just gonna crash randomly. If you use this software, it's gonna work perfectly fine. A canary version of application is the absolute bleeding edge version. This is the version that was literally just released. It's gonna have cool new features that may not be available in the stable version, but it's also not guaranteed to be stable. It might just randomly crash, we got no idea, that's not our problem. Whereas a daily or a nightly version of an application is going to be similar to a Canary application, but only released once a day, either during the day or at night, depending on when they want to release it. You might also hear weekly or monthly, but those are a bit less common. At that point, they usually just don't bother using the term. A few times I've mentioned this core that every single Linux distribution is going to have, the Linux kernel. This sits basically directly above your hardware, providing things like process management, memory management, drivers, system calls to allow applications to actually access these things, and allow software to have a consistent interface to actually develop against. If you didn't have something providing all of these drivers, every single piece of software you use would have to go and write that software to work on every bit of hardware available. That's completely unmanageable, so instead you have companies like AMD, Intel, NVIDIA providing GPU drivers, you have other companies providing USB drivers, other companies providing Wi-Fi drivers, things like that, and then the applications you use can go and call that stuff that exists inside of the kernel. Now, even though every Linux distribution has to have a Linux kernel, not every Linux kernel is going to be the same, and it's not always just changing because of different version numbers. So, like any other open source application on your system, the Linux kernel can actually be forked. And some users and some distributions do this to add in features that maybe the software they want to use actually needs, or maybe they want to remove features they don't need because that's just slowing down the kernel. Now, when you turn your computer on, the kernel is one of the earliest programs that's going to start, but it's absolutely not the first. Something that starts directly before the kernel is known as a bootloader. This has one job, tell the kernel to start. Now, the reason why we use a bootloader is because we are far from the days where we would buy a computer 
and the operating system on that computer is the only one that runs. It's not like when, say, you buy a computer, it has Windows 7 on it, then you have to throw it away to start using Windows 8, or you have Windows 10, you have to throw it away to start, actually, wait, with Windows 11, maybe you have to do that. But most other operating systems, you can just go and replace what is already there with whatever you want. This is why we have a bootloader in a known location, so the program that starts before the bootloader knows where to find the thing to do the next step. Now, if you boot your Linux system and you don't see a GUI, but instead see something more like this, this is known as a TTY. This is the way that you interact with Linux if you do not have a GUI. Everything you want to do is going to work exactly the same way, except if you try to do something, you know, that actually needs the GUI. If you're trying to run terminal commands, though, all of that's going to work perfectly fine. Now, speaking of terminals, I assume that most people know what it is, even if they have no interest in actually using it. It is this window where we can go and type random commands and do things on our system. Now, one thing that I see a lot of people doing is mistaking a terminal with a shell. So a terminal is the thing that gives you this window. It controls the key binds, it controls the font, it controls the theme you're seeing, but it doesn't actually run any of the commands. All of the commands that you want to run are being run in something known as a shell. Shells are things like bash, zsh, dash. Most of them are going to do what you want it to do. It's not until you start getting into things like shell scripting where it starts to actually matter what one you're actually using. Now, I'm sure there's hundreds of other words that I could include in a video like this. I wanted to focus on the terms that I see very frequently showing up in things like distro reviews and Linux videos that I can totally understand a new user being really confused about. I didn't want to focus on specific applications. Like I could explain what each of the different desktop environments are, but if you know what a desktop environment is, that's enough to at least send you in the correct direction to do your own research. Now, if there are any terms you feel like I should have included but just never got around to, feel free to leave a comment down below and let me know what it is. And if you need help with it, I can help you, or I'm sure hundreds of other people know the answer to it as well. So that's going to be pretty much it for me. And if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon subscribers only bearer paid link in the comment section comment sec link in the description down below i've got a podcast called tech over t available basically anywhere i've got a gaming channel called brody rops and plays where i live stream twice a week and upload about five or youtube shorts and this channel is also available over on odyssey that's gonna be it for me and i'm out <laughs>